I appreciate that, but I think it's time that he get a taste of something else because I just can't with that history. In accordance with the laws of state of this court. Oh, oh, hey. oh, 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 hey. Well, he's the guy who made headlines by jumping over the bench and attacking the judge who was about to sentence him to prison. Let's do a deeper dive into this absolutely insane case with the Honorable Mitchell Goldberg, United States District Court Judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime, Jesse Weber. We got to talk about this case. It's one that actually was all over the news, but we haven't had a chance to really tackle it. This is the guy who jumped over the bench and attacked a judge out of Nevada. You know what I'm talking about. The defendant is 30-year-old Deober Redden, and he was in Clark County District Court in front of Judge Mary Kay Holthus. This is a guy, by the way, with an extensive criminal record of felonies and misdemeanors, including for domestic violence and robberies. And he was in court that day to face sentencing after pleading guilty to an attempted battery charge for a baseball attack, a baseball bat attack, I should say. He actually pled guilty to this reduced charge. Initially, he was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. So now he's in court. He's going to be sentenced. Now, during this hearing, his attorney was asking for probation, not any kind of prison time. And Redden makes a statement that he is a person who never stops trying to do the right thing, no matter how hard it is, says that I'm not a rebellious person. This is what he tells the judge. But he also says that, you know, in terms of prison, if the sentence, if it's appropriate for you, then you have to do what you have to do. Okay. Well, it seemed that Judge Holthus was going to do what she had to do because she was indicating that probation wasn't sufficient. She said, I appreciate that, but I think it's time that he get a taste of something else because I just can't with that history. Right after she makes that statement, right after, Redden curses her out, sprints towards the judge, vaults over the bench, and attacks her. It's incredible to see. I mean, really, really incredible. You, you want to talk about him not being a rebellious person? What do you think that is? I mean, imagine that. He ends up fighting with the judge, you know, grabs her hair. Uh, her head hits the wall. He fights the clerk, the marshal, a police officer. He's facing a slew of new charges, counts of battery on a protected person, battery of an officer, battery by a prisoner, intimidating a public officer, extortion, and even attempted murder. A court-martial had to receive all these stitches. He suffered a dislocated shoulder, according to authorities. Apparently, the judge, as I said, her head was hit in the wall. Redden actually put his hands around her throat. She sustained some injuries, but she was okay. How do I know she was okay? Because she was back in court, back at work, only days later, officially sentenced Redden. He was brought back into her courtroom again, this time in restraints, gloves, a spit mask. She ended up sentencing him to 19 months to four years in prison on that original charge. But now, like I said, he faces all of these new charges because of what he did in court. Now, with that in mind, let me bring on right now a special guest, the Honorable Mitchell Goldberg, United States District Court Judge for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for coming on, Judge. What a story to talk about. Uh, let me first just get your reaction to seeing this because it's not every day. You see a judge being attacked in his or her own courtroom. Thank you for having me on, Jesse. And my reaction was probably the same as every judge, state and federal in the country who saw it. It was horrifying uh, that someone with that kind of record was able to get that close to a jurist and actually, you know, inflict some what could have been a lot worse harm on uh, her and and her staff. I I hadn't heard the extent of the injuries, but uh, what I observed and I did watch the video, it, it could have been a lot worse. It really could have been. I mean, I've seen videos before where fights break out in courtrooms. I saw one recently where uh, you know a fight breaks out with the defendant and the victim's family, and, and this whole melee it happens in the courtroom. Somebody actually runs past the judge, but it's rare that you see a judge being attacked, and and, and that was really disturbing to see. Have you ever felt any kind of concern or, you know, in your courtroom about what someone might do? Is How rare is this to see this happen? I've never seen in, in all my years of, of uh, being a lawyer and or a judge, which is coming up on about 40, and I was a state and federal prosecutor for, for quite some time before I became a judge. I've never seen that kind of 
in a close encounter, but it's different for each jurisdiction. And I'm certainly not familiar with uh, state court uh, practices and safety practices um, and protecting judges in the state of Nevada. And I think that was a state court matter, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So I'm in the federal court where we have the privilege and the honor of being protected by the United States Marshal Service. And I, I'm not sure of the resources, but I'm going to I'm going to guess, Jesse, that the resources, the funding to the United States Marshal Service that's tasked with protecting federal judges, both in and out of the courtroom, um, the, the, the resource, resources are plentiful. Uh, so I have in the courtroom, um, you're always a little bit on edge, but it really you know depends on who is appearing in front of you. So for instance, I just sentenced someone not more than 20 minutes ago to life in prison um, who was involved in a very, very serious crime uh, involving kidnapping, retribution for stealing drugs, and the kidnapping resulted in an execution. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat a little bit more. Uh, I'm aware that the person has a, a history of, of, a, of being dangerous and violent. And our marshal service, the, the persons who transport the prisoners and are in our courtroom in federal court, um, they, they're they aware on, on, on who's in court and what the crimes were and what their history was. So appropriate security you know, was taken for each case. Now we, in federal court, we do a lot of financial crimes where there's no history of violence. So I'm going to assume that the marshal service, um, I mean, they protect us beautifully, you know, no matter what is happening in a, in a criminal case. But um, I think there's a, certainly a ramp up and a ramp down depending on who appears in front of us. And I appreciate you saying that the difference between the resources that you have at your disposal versus what a state court has. I mean, I will tell you, I'm bothered by the lack of courtroom security there. I mean, the fact that the court clerk had to throw in punches. I mean, that's what it observed to me in this courtroom. You know, I, I was covering the Harvey Weinstein trial out in New York. Again, this is a guy who was uh, convicted of sex crimes, very serious, but, you know, no kind of criminal history. When that sentencing happened, when the sentencing happened, there were court martials lined all across that courtroom. I mean, on each side. Now, I imagine it was also because they wanted to make sure none of the reporters in there were going to be taking photos or videos. But whenever a sentencing is about to happen, that feels like one of the most dramatic moments. Now, we've seen cases before where, you know, defendants fight their attorneys during a regular hearing. But during a sentencing especially, when someone is going to be sentenced to prison and their life is going to be changed, you would have thought maybe in that courtroom there should have been a little bit more precautions put in place. Are you bothered by what you saw there, maybe a lack of courtroom security? I'm bothered that the poor judge had to endure what happened. But I don't really want to comment on the security. I mean, I watched the video like yeah. you did. I wasn't able to see how the defendant was able to get from counsel table to the bench. And I don't know the resources that the state of Nevada and that courtroom are dealing with. So, you know, I don't want to openly criticize well, and, them. And, without, and just to, and just to be clear, and just to be clear, he had taken a deal where he wasn't technically in custody, so they didn't have him in restraints. He wasn't in jail garb. Um, they might be rethinking that protocol moving forward, but because he took a deal with prosecutors to this reduced charge. So that was one of the reasons he wasn't shackled up. But I'll, I'll give you the, you know, the next point on that. Well, we, I'll, I will comment on, you know, what I've observed as the beneficiary of the marshal's security. I'm not in charge of security, but we work right. very closely together. So by way of one example, about four years ago, I had a multi-defendant uh, case where the defendants were accused of robbing, kidnapping, and torturing drug dealers. So these folks were really, really dangerous. And the marshal service uh, and I, we had daily, you know, meetings about um, the, the the high level of security that happened that, that needed to happen in that courtroom. And there were, you know, quite a few options. So we ended up with, and this is all public, so I'm not disclosing any uh, confidential information. We ended up with dividing up the case. It was a 20 defendant matter. We took five of the most culpable defendants first. Five is what the marshals felt comfortable um offering security for in the courtroom not more than five 
and shackles were used um, on the ankles. Now, uh, you're probably aware that uh, when there's a jury, and this was a jury trial, uh, you can't show the jury that the defendant is um, currently in custody. It's unfair right. to the defendant. So how do you impart security when that happens? Well, first of all, the defendants are not brought in in front of the jury in prison uh, garb, you know, right. the, the, the red or, or, or orange jumpsuits. They're given access to, um, to suits and, and, and nice clothing. And then how do we, how did the marshals effectuate the, the ankle bracelets? What we did was we set up aprons in front of counsel table. We brought the defendants in first before the jury. We got them seated. Their handcuffs were taken off. So it's very complicated because you ha we deal with, all courts deal with in criminal cases, the very, um, sometimes very dangerous people, but we have to afford them their rights as well so they're sure. they're not prejudiced in front of the jury yeah it's a complicated issue uh completely understand that i, I did want your perspective on on some of the actions from the judges in this case because there were two so the judge mary Kay holthus she comes back to court i mean incredibly brave to do this um and, but also her obligation she was the sentencing judge here and she, our understanding is she sentences him to 19 months to four years in prison but that was going to be her original uh, sentence. She didn't change it despite the attack on her. Very bold. Very. I have to give her credit uh, for doing that. What was your take on that? Well, I think that she probably knew that the defendant was going to be charged for the assault on her. And there would be a, a, a reckoning if he was found guilty of that at another time. In federal court, again, I'm not proficient in the state criminal laws in Nevada. In federal court, we're allowed to consider what's called relevant conduct. So we can we consider the crime, we consider a lot of other factors, rehabilitation, safety of the community, and other, other things under the appropriate statute. We can also consider what's called relevant conduct. That is conduct that's separate from the actual crime. And in federal court, the sentencing judge could have considered that conduct, which we all saw, which was him mm -hmm. flying over the bench trying to uh, injure the judge. The fact that she didn't consider it, I can only guess that she knew he was going to be charged and, if convicted, uh, brought to justice and sentenced anew on that crime. And we're going to talk about those extra charges in a second, but just with respect to the charge that he's now sentenced to. In light of everything that's happened, I can't see him getting out before four years. Would I be totally wrong about that? I mean, four years is the maximum on the charge that he was just sentenced to. But in light of everything that we just saw, any chance that with that charge specifically that he, he'd get out before then? I, I, don't, I don't know the sentencing standards in right. Nevada state law, but he, he's serving already four years, right, on the on the on the initial crime he's been charged with assault if he's convicted of that i could tell you if he was in pennsylvania uh i don't think he would be getting out uh before four years well let's now talk about these other charges so obviously he's hit with a slew of battery charges for just attacking so many people in the courtroom the two charges that i thought were really interesting were attempted murder and extortion um do you think that applies in this kind of scenario with the attack on the judge? Um, do you think it's too aggressive? I mean, as I mentioned, he had his hands uh, on her throat. Um, and so what did you think of attempted murder and extortion charges? I'm not sure I understand the extortion charge, but I'll say this about the attempted murder. As a former state and federal prosecutor, um, generally, generally the... Um, the strategy is you look at the facts that you could prove, you look at the elements of the crimes, and you generally charge the most serious um, charges that you can to gain a prosecutorial advantage. Um, whether, uh, I don't know the extent of the injuries, I, don't, I haven't talked to the judge, and it was hard to see what happened when she was tackled behind the bench, uh, hypothetically, if 
there was an attempt to strangle her, then perhaps an attempted murder charge would be warranted. Um, but uh, the prosecutors initially are always going to charge what they believe are the most serious charges. Whether attempted murder can be borne out, that's up to the Nevada courts to figure out. And in terms of extortion, this is the best way I think I can explain it, is that uh, because she is a, a public official, he was trying to influence what she would do by threatening her. I don't know. What do you think? I think I'll pass on that one because <laughs> right. I'm not sure what I think. <laughs> All right, that's fine. That's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't want to second guess the prosecutors in Nevada, and I don't want to second guess the judges in Nevada. These are just charges, remember. Yeah. Yes. Let's, let's also remember this is a this is a crime. Guilty, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. However, it's on video. Yeah. So yeah. not sure what, you know, short of some type of diminished capacity uh, mental health defense, I'm not sure what the defense is going to be. That, that's fair. And and there have been reports about his mental health concerns and, and issues there. Um, but, but the fact, it seems to me, would it benefit him to plead guilty? to these charges in light of so much strong evidence he committed these crimes? In federal court, and I'm sure, because I'm very familiar still with Pennsylvania state uh, criminal law, and I think I'll even go out on a limb and say it probably applies in Las Vegas and Nevada, a uh, showing of remorse and contrition is always a positive factor in uh, sentencing. I did want to ask you before I let you go, there was a legal issue that happened with one of the judges, um, and we wanted a little explanation the best that you can. So let me lay this out for everybody to explain it. When he was originally being sentenced, before he attacked the judge, he was actually eligible for $54,000 bail. And our understanding is in Nevada, if he put up a certain percentage of it, about like $8,000, he, he could technically be released. Okay. Then he attacks Judge Holthus. He has to appear in another courtroom for a bail hearing, and the prosecutors were adamant uh, that they were looking for a no bail setting. In fact, uh, they didn't want him to have any option of bail. The other judge, this was not Judge Holthus, this was another judge that was determining the bail, um, she needed, she, she, what happened was she wanted him to be in the courtroom, but Redden refused to leave his jail cell. He wouldn't come to the bail hearing. And this judge said, well, if he's not going to be here, I don't think it's fair. I can't, I don't want to set conditions of his bail or change his bail if he's not present. The Clark County uh, DA, Mr. Wolfson said, well, we asked for a no bail setting. We asked that he be detained because we believe that he is a danger to the community. The world has seen what happened yesterday and this person's behavior in court. And I've almost seen nothing else like this. So we believe he's an extreme danger to the community. He was disappointed uh, that the judge would not, uh, you know, take away the bail setting. Um, but again, it, it's now moot because he's already been sentenced and he's now uh, has all these charges. But what would have led uh, a judge to decide that after he attacks another judge to not change the bail settings, regardless of whether he's in that courtroom or not, regardless of whether he chooses not to be in that courtroom or not? I would say he forfeited his right. And in light of what he just did to this judge. I was curious about that, wanted to ask you your perspective on it real quick. Sure. Well, you have to remember that as a, as a jurist, as a judicial officer, we, especially in criminal matters, I mean, we have to think about the rights of both sides, but in criminal matters, when you're talking about the possibility of someone's liberty being at stake, the benefit of the doubt always goes to the defendant and the burden always goes to the prosecution. Now, Jesse, I can comment on what would happen, the process that I would impart, and I can't really say whether it has or not, so this is more in a hypothetical, but let's suppose in, an, in a similar proceeding, let's take the bail proceeding, we have bail proceedings in federal court, and let's say a defendant is brought over to the courthouse, uh, he's in the holding cell, and we say, let's start the proceeding, and it's reported to me by the marshals, the defendant is refusing to appear. So the question I think you're posing is, would I proceed or not? Okay. So what I think I would do in your hypothetical is, um, and I have done actually, I'll tell you, you have the marshal, you swear in the marshal and you say, 
Marshall, I want you, or you've now been sworn in, I want you to go down to the holding cell and I want you to say the following to the defendant. Mr. Defendant, you, we are going to conduct a bail hearing. You have an absolute right to be here. I would prefer that you are here. I would prefer that you're here because I want to hear your side of the story. You have a right to come to my courtroom. I do not want to proceed without you. And the marshal relays that to the defendant. The marshal comes back up under oath and relays what is uh, the defendant's position is. And in order to you know, move things along in situations where defendants refuse to be uh, part of a proceeding, after a lot of steps are taken and after a careful record is made, my view is that you can proceed, mm. and I'm not criticizing the Las Vegas judge, but mm -hmm. you know, at some point, you, a defendant can be found to forfeit their very precious right to be in a courtroom uh, during all proceedings. I appreciate that, uh, providing a little bit more clarity on what potential options could it be. Uh, in terms of Mr. Redden, I'll let everybody know, uh, he appeared in court this past week before a different judge, uh, and a preliminary hearing has been set for February 14th on all of these new charges that he is going to be facing. The Honorable Mitchell Goldberg, thank you so much for making your sidebar debut. Really appreciate you taking the time. And hopefully the next time we talk, it's not about a judge being attacked, but maybe some other kind of case. But thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Jesse. Take care. All right, everybody. That is all we have for you right now here on Sidebar. Thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. Speak to you next time. Thank you.